My grandfather's name, nickname, was Happy. Happy Campbell, the local dry cleaner. And for someone who lost an eye as a young man in a blast furnace accident, and who lived through two world wars and the Great Depression, Happy's a pretty good description of the way I remember him. The last few months of his life, Happy developed what I look back and now recognize as serious heart disease. And one sunny day in November, uh, he slumped over at his table and died of a heart attack. He was 69 years old. Now at the time that he died, Happy was still able to do most of the things that he really enjoyed doing in life. Compare that with the life of Happy's daughter. That was my mother, Betty. Betty also died of a heart attack, but thanks to a lot of modern medicine, she was 16 years older than her father was when he died. Some of those years were good years, but the last few uh, certainly were not. Her health declined gradually. She hobbled, she was hobbled by a chronic back pain. She couldn't see or navigate well enough to drive her own car. She could no longer cook for herself. And after a very serious medical event brought on by the mismanagement of her own medications, we were forced to put her in a home. That was a difficult decision for me. But it wasn't as difficult as having to take away her pet chihuahua, Fifi, because she could no longer remember whether she'd fed her or not. Now, I tell you this family anecdote because it illustrates a larger global pattern. And that is, even though we are living longer than any humans ever have before, there's a price to be paid for that extra life. And that price is that we spend more years in frailty and ill health than ever before as well. By dying when he did, Happy avoided most of those life quality degrading maladies that, uh, that my mother suffered. And those maladies, many of them were once rare, but now they're commonplace as we live longer and longer. Alzheimer's disease, osteoporosis, Half of all people, 85 and over, require some sort of assistive device, so a walker, a wheelchair, simply to move around. About the same fraction are also battling dementia. And 85 is no longer an exceptionally long life. Now, because of this, we're living longer and longer in frailty than ever before, aging, and the diseases and conditions it causes, which is virtually every single celebrity disease you've heard of, has become the number one health problem globally. It threatens to overwhelm our healthcare system, disrupt our economy, and to the extent that it does these things, potentially even poison relations among generations. Now the reason ironically, that we found ourselves in this strange predicament is a consequence of our own success. For decades, medicine has been highly successful at finding more and more and more ways to delay our dying. But what it hasn't found is a way to delay our aging. Now, the medical research structure, in fact, is not even organized in such a way that it can address aging. Researchers focus on one disease, one disease at a time. Heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, osteoporosis, arthritis, you can just think of those foundations that send you those little flyers in the mail asking for money. But it's become pretty obvious as more and more people live longer and longer that fixing medical problems one at a time as they crop up is almost pointless. If you fix one problem, like a whack-a-mole, another pops up, and then another, and then another. It's like your aging car. But aging itself, which is the medical condition that we'd really like to treat, is not magic. It's a physical process, 
like any physical process, it has underlying causes, and those causes can be discovered. In fact, a small group of us worldwide have been working for the last few decades on trying to discover those processes. And we've succeeded in discovering many of them. And this offers a really exciting prospect. And that prospect is the most exciting medical advance since the discovery of antibiotics almost 90 years ago. Because if we can learn to treat the underlying causes of aging like we've learned to treat the underlying causes of individual diseases, then we can delay most or all of those maladies of aging as a group. See these pills? Let me tell you a little about what we know these pills can do. If you start taking them in midlife, they'll prevent Alzheimer's disease. But it's a medication, and like any medications, there are some side effects. One of the side effects is that they also prevent several types of cancer. And heart disease and stroke, and they pr preserve muscle tone and coordination and improve sleep and even keep at bay those normal lapses of memory that we all have as we get older. Even better, these pills cost only a few cents a day. In fact, that entire bottle costs less than $5. Now, I hear, I, I, I can feel some skepticism <laughs> out there. I mean, doesn't this sound like the crazy old story of the fountain of youth? In fact, and isn't that just a crazy fantasy? In fact, I agree. The fountain of youth is a crazy fantasy. But the fountain of longer health is not. And it's easy to see if you just think about it and look around you. Because some people, some rare lucky individuals seem to already have drunk from that fountain. So think about Fauja Singh, for instance, a man who started distance running in his 80s, completed his first marathon at the age of 89, and completed his last marathon at the age of 101. That is, unless he comes out of retirement, he's just about to celebrate his 104th birthday. Or Irving Kahn, who ran a successful Wall Street investment firm until he was 105. Or even your Uncle Charlie. Seems like everybody has a relative like Uncle Charlie, who's in his 90s and he's ready to try anything and still sharp as a tack. What if we could all age as successfully as the Sings and the Cons and the Uncle Charlies of the world? Now you may be thinking, why haven't I heard of this? Why haven't I heard of this? Well, this is a medication that I suspect many people in the audience are already taken. It's in fact the most popularly prescribed drug to treat diabetes and prediabetes in the world. Who would have ever thought that it might also treat aging? Now, let me be clear about what I'm saying about metformin. I'm not saying that if you take it, you're going to be immortal. You might like to hear that, but that's not true, and you're not going to live 500 years. And people that tell you advances like that are just around the corner are either charlatans trying to sell you some expensive pill or potion or lotion, or they're honest people who've been deluded by hope and an unreasonable fear of death. But what I am saying is that an extra 10 to 20 years of healthy life is well within our grasp. Now, there's one thing other that I didn't tell you about metformin, because you might be wondering, why hasn't this been blaring from every television screen, every computer monitor in the world? Um, the reason is that all of those multiple health benefits that I described, we know they occur, 
but they occur in mice. But yet, we're just ready to start the first human trial to see if what these drugs do in mice, they also do in people. That trial is expected to take six years. And if this first drug doesn't work, we actually have, that's not the only weapon in the armamentarium. We have at least a half dozen other drugs lined up for testing behind metformin, like, like airplanes on a runway ready for takeoff. And if this one doesn't work, then one of the others likely will. So as we sit here, looking forward into the 21st century, imagining that the world will continue to get older and older, a critical question is not whether we'll find medications that will give us an extra decade or two of health and vigor. We will. The important question is what are we gonna do with those extra years? Here's a really boring and unimaginative idea. We'll do the same thing, we'll just do it longer. We, you know, we may be forced to work a little longer if we're staying that healthy, but our retirement could be dramatically longer. Well, that's not for me. I have to tell you that I think we can do better. I think there's better ideas. And here's one. Maybe we could use this opportunity to reimagine the normal trajectory of life, just as it was reimagined more than a century ago when we invented two whole new phases of life. We invented childhood and we invented retirement. Before that, of course, people worked from the time they were physically able till the time they fell over. But that trajectory of childhood, school, family, kids, career, retirement, that's over a century old now. Maybe it's time to try something else and I'll have, here's one idea. Childhood, school, family, kids, career, back to school, new career, public service. Maybe we'd even have a third or a fourth career in there. Because it may be time now that technology changes so quickly and new skills are required so often and new opportunities turn, uh, 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 emerge that it's time for us to really think seriously about life as a sequential series of interesting careers. Now you notice I didn't mention retirement and that's because we now know that happiness in later life, or actually at any time in life, is tied to a sense of purpose, a reason to get up in the morning beyond simple, aimless leisure. And so there are many realms of public service that are perfectly compatible with flexible hours, and as long as we have our physical and mental health, we can take advantage of them we could work in a local library. We could help out at the park, volunteer at the hospital, be a docent in the museum. We might read to preschool children or work in a food bank or a homeless shelter. The possibilities are, are really endless. So as we stand here now, looking into the future, unlike our ancestors a century ago, who couldn't possibly have foreseen that by today, we'd be living 30 years longer than they did, we can foresee that as this century progresses, our health will get better and better and last longer and longer. So it's up to us to make the most of that foresight. Thank you. <laughs>